All right, well, next up is Lance Vickers. Lance came highly recommended for this presentation on the state of the forest. And as Lance is getting set up again, I remind everybody to put your questions in the question and answer section of, the, uh, of Zoom. Lance is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Missouri School of Natural Resources, where he works closely with Dr. Ben Knapp and several forest service research scientists. His research focus on regeneration and young stand dynamics at multiple scales. His most recent work has focused on developing analytics to quantify and inter interpret regeneration patterns of many Eastern US tree species and forest communities using national forest inventory data. Lance completed his PhD quantitative civil culture at Mizzou in 2015 and prior to that earned an MS at Virginia Tech studying Appalachian civil culture. He received his undergraduate training as a forester at the University of Arkansas Monticello. Outside of work, Lance says he once enjoyed or still enjoys exploring the world on family adventures and still hopes to eventually complete the family national park passport stamp collection. And I see that Lance has shared his screen and is ready to go. So take it away, Lance. All right, good morning. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction and thank you to Director Pauly for the um, very wonderful remarks there. Um, happy to say that some of the uh, points she made are gonna be featured in my talk today. So uh, maybe I won't be belaboring them. Maybe I'll just be highlighting some of those points. Uh, but nonetheless, thanks again for having me here. Um, happy to be with you today. Um, also a bit humbled to be delivering a state of the forest address. Uh, and the reason for the most part is that I'm confident that uh, most any field forester or biologist or ecologist has their finger more close to the pulse of the forest um, than, than what I do now. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the office lately. My office to field ratio has been way um, wrong sided. Um, but nonetheless, um, I'm, I'm hopefully that uh, I'll leave you with a nugget or two of uh, some useful information. Um, and I'm confident that uh, if the roles were reversed, I would learn much more from you. Uh, then you will learn from me. But nonetheless, um, we'll continue and, and talk about the state of the forest today. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to take just a moment uh, for some acknowledgments. The first being the USDA uh, Forest Service Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. All the data that I'll be discussing today um, is a product of that. Uh, now, some of the analyses are my own, uh, but sometimes not. Sometimes I shamelessly pulled facts and um, elements of figures uh, from various resource bulletins and publications that folks like uh, Thomas Goff and, and Tom Treeman and others uh, have put together. And so I greatly appreciate their efforts, uh, the effort of the entire FIA program, field crews, as well as the folks uh, with the state that help organize and cooperate um, with that program. Uh, thanks for that great effort. You really have made my career possible in terms of analyzing national regeneration data. Um, and also thanks to the Forest Summit organizers for inviting me and putting this together. It's an important talk. It looks like a great slate of speakers, and I am looking forward to uh, hearing what everyone else has to say. Uh, so with that, I guess we'll dive in. Did you know, and now that we've listened to Director Pauly, we all should know that we have over 15 million acres of forest land in the state of Missouri. Uh, that equates to around 34% of the total land area here in Missouri. Um, or if you want to look at it a different way, it equates to around two and a half acres for each of us Missourians. Um, now, I haven't found my two and a half acres yet. If you're walking around the forest and find the Vickers Reserve somewhere, send me the address. I'd like to come visit it sometime. Uh, but nonetheless, two and a half acres of forest land for each Missourian. Um, around 96% of the forest land in Missouri is timberland, which more or less um, is a designation that means that traditional forest operations and productivity measures um, it could be at least plausible on this forest land. It's not, you know, sort of um, uh, edge and buffer and, and, and low quality land. It's, uh, you might be able to practice forest on it, uh, forest operations on it. So um, most of the forest land in Missouri is actually timberland as well. There are nearly 8 billion trees in Missouri, a number that I can't really wrap my head around. Uh, 8 billion is a lot of anything. Um, we have nearly 8 billion trees, which equates to around 500 trees per forested acre on average across the state. Um, or if you were visiting your two and a half acre forest uh, that each of us Missourians could claim, uh, that you'd find around 1,300 trees on that two and a half acres. Um, so some interesting um, sort of figures there. I was shocked to learn 
that there are nearly 100 tree species growing in Missouri. I did not know that. Um, I knew there was a lot, but 100 is quite a bit. Um, so that's a really impressive amount. Uh, and across the state in total, uh, growth exceeds removals in terms of our forest operations. Uh, so that's uh, a good indicator of saying that at least on average across the state, um, forest practices are sustainable. It doesn't mean every acre is, but in total across the state, uh, we practice sustainable forestry. And again, just want to give a, a brief shout out to the uh, uh, FIA uh, group. Um, that's all the data I'll be using today. And uh, such as this heat map here we see on the right, where is the percent cover of forest land across the state, where the brighter colors like more greens and yellows indicate more forest cover uh, than the darker colors, which indicate less. Um, that sort of data and everything else I'll be talking about is FI. So thanks to those guys again. Some quick facts. Around 64,000 acres a year revert from non-forest to forests. Uh, so that's sort of a, a gain. Um, on the other hand, we lose around 71,000 acres each year that are converted from forest to, you know, development, housing, fragmentation, pasture land, ag land, uh, what have you. So it's um, not quite a wash, but almost as a wash, a little bit net negative there. Um, but forest land, for the most part, has been stable for the past 15 years or so. Around 180,000 acres each year are harvested or thinned, whereas around 90,000 acres, 91,000, are disturbed by a fire of some sort, according to the data. And around 31,000 are disturbed by weather. Uh, now, these trends can vary from year to year. These are the most recent annual numbers from 2019. Um, but I thought those were some interesting insights that uh, you might find useful. Forest ownership across the state of Missouri is overwhelmingly private. 82% of the forest land is owned by private uh, owners, whether it's individuals, corporations, um, or, or other related uh, private landowners. It's 82%. Um, so that two and a half acres that each of us Missourians thought we might have, uh, really if we think of it only in terms of public land, we each have around a half an acre of quote unquote public forest land per Missourian. The majority of public forest is U.S. Forest Service, which is a total makes up around 10% of the forest land in Missouri. State and local governments hold around 6% and other federal agencies hold around 2%. The age structure of the forest, this is another one that uh, Director Pauly hinted at, and, and or actually she just mentioned it outright. Um, age structure, maybe we have a midlife crisis going on uh, in the, the forest of Missouri. Uh, you see this, this graph to the left here we sort of have this age distribution where we have young forests on the left and forests over 100 years old on the right. We sort of have this, you know, this bell-shaped distribution where most of the forests are concentrating in this 40 to 100 um, year old age classes, the vast majority of it being in the 60 to 80 year old class. If we break those four or five, um, those five or six groups there down into more, fewer number of groups here on the right and classify them as young, whole aged, mature, and old forest, you can see that 60% of the forest almost are in this mature category. Uh, we have lots of forests in that category, and another 28% are in the whole um, age classes. 11% are old, and 4% are young. How has that changed uh, through the recent history? Um, well, if you look on the graph on the left, we can see that mature forests have been steadily increasing in the state. Uh, mature forests of acres have been steadily increasing in the state over the past 15 years or so. Um, at the same time, we saw slight decreases in pole age stands, and that's perfectly understandable. Those pole age stands are aging into that mature age class, so they're just getting older, and those pole age stands are becoming mature. Um, old stands, which is on the road to being old growth, um, have been pretty flat at around 11%, uh, and there is, uh, a lot of concern in Missouri and other places about old growth being underrepresented on the landscape. Um, and certainly we could have more of it on our landscape here. The good news is um, that we are well positioned to have Lance, your sound cut out. Standard. If we move to the graph on the right, um, we see that uh, young forest is decreasing. 
And actually, we're on pace by 2030 to have half of the young forest we have um, had at 2003. Uh, so we're declining pretty dr dramatically. Over the course of 25 years or so, we're going to cut it in half. Um, so that's something alarming we should keep our eye on. Okay, um, and how's that played out on various ownerships? Um, we can see that across, um, across time, young forest has declined more rapidly on forest service lands than on others, but it's more recently stabilized. Um, but there are declines across the board. Um, again, some are more drastic than others, but we hope um, that that is flatlining and we can start reversing that trend. And again, don't forget the Utes. That's a reference to my cousin Vinny. I don't know if I'm too old or too young to make that reference, uh, but you know, hopefully somebody got it there. Okay, prominent forest types across the state. Um, this should come as probably no surprise to anyone. Missouri is an oak and hickory dominated state. 80% of the forest land in the state is under this umbrella term of oak and hickory forest. Um, now within that sort of umbrella group of oak and hickory, there are various subcategories, forest types. Um, and the most prominent of those are the white and red oak group with some hickory mixed in. Um, it's over 6 million acres of forest land by itself. White oak forest type, um, it's also around uh, 2 million acres of forest land. And um, then we have post and blackjack oak moving down to mixed hardwood. Uh, those are the four most prominent oak and hickory forest types within that oak and hickory umbrella. We're also likely to find elm ash and cottonwood forest types across the state, riparian type forests, uh, they make up about 8% of the forest land, and oak pines, what we think of as mixed woods, are also fairly common. And some other forest types there that we have, several others actually, um, you may see somewhere, but they're, they're not a major component of the landscape. So as a whole, forest land acreage has been relatively stable uh, over the last 15 years or so. Um, to slightly increasing. Um, and we've saw slight increases in total acreage across all the forest types, uh, all the forest type groups, I should say, uh, that we see here. Uh, usually it's to the tune of something like 100,000 acres or so that we've gained over the past 15 years or so. Now for some forest type groups like oak and hickory, that's just 1% of their total. But for others, more underrepresented I shouldn't say underrepresented, the more less abundant, less prevalent forest types, elm ash cottonwood, oak gum cypress, that gain of 100,000 acres is a substantial amount relative to their initial proportions. Um, but we've got some slight uh, impressive gains in all those categories. Um, the ones I'd like to point out uh, in a little more detail, though, are trends that we're seeing in the oak hickory forest type groups. Um, that 1% gain or the 100,000 acres or so was largely driven uh, by increases in the white oak forest type. It gained 21% relative to its 2004 levels, as opposed to some of the other forest types in the oak hickory group, like black and scarlet oaks, decreased by 34%. So we had a net increase in oak hickory forest, largely driven by the increases in the white oak type at the expense of, um, or as opposed to things like black and scarlet oaks. And if you're wondering why, mixed hardwoods or sassafras persimmon and elm ash locust are within the umbrella of oak hickory. Join the club. I don't know why either, but that's how they're categorized and uh, there's really nothing I can do about that. Um, but they're within that too, so we have to sort of take this information uh, carefully when we're looking at broad trends like that. Another interesting bit of information, this oak pine group here, mixed woods, got a 3% gain in mixed wood acreage across the state. Um, which sounds good, but it's maybe not what we expect to uh, have had once we take that number just on, as a headline. Um, look, we see we've lost 16% in the shortleaf pine oak category here, but we've gained 15% in the cedar hardwood. I don't know why this is an oak pine group. It is, um, and that actually that increase in cedar hardwood acreage is masking the losses uh, and more than compensating for them uh, in the shortleaf pine oak category, uh, so much so that we see the net gain. Uh, so sort of have a switcheroo here, not acre for acre, but across the state in total, uh, cedar has surpassed 
um, shortly pine uh, in terms of mixed wood acres of late. Okay. And mixed woods are uh, an important part of the landscape in Missouri, and they're gaining recognition across um, really the eastern U.S. Uh, and, and typically the Missouri uh, mixed woods we think of a shortleaf pine oak. Um, and you can see from the range map there on the left, while somewhere in the Arkansas Washita's or Ozarks is probably the heart of the shortleaf pine oak range um, for that mixed wood type. Well, we have a sizable component of it here in the southeast uh, Missouri. And if we look at all mixed wood types uh, across the northern U.S. there on the right, where any shading represents evidence of some mixed wood and the darker shading, the darker blue it is, uh, the more prevalent the mixed woods are. You know, we're not on the scale of things uh, like hemlock and, and spruce and, and maple and beech uh, type mixed woods in the Northeast or in the Lake States, but we have our fair share of mixed woods here in Missouri. Um, but again, you know, we, we sort of have these two different types. We have this yellow pine, or that's the short leaf pine oak type in the sort of pink on the left. And then we have the juniper, or the cedar uh, hardwood mixed woods uh, that are in the green there. And you can see they don't, there's some overlap, but they sort of uh, occupy more or less um, uh, different places. And uh, those trends are gonna be different. And, and one of the things that we're concerned about with mixed woods, and we're growing uh, in recognition and understanding is that just because you have mixed wood today doesn't mean you're gonna have one in the future. Uh, and there's sort of this old, old saw among uh, foresters that you know, if you wanna have oaks, plant pines. If you wanna have pines, plant oaks. Uh, which might lead you to believe that, you know, they grow well together, um, you know, and it, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. But actually, having a mixed wood understory beneath a mixed wood overstory is, is at least in our types, uh, pretty hard to come by. Uh, and that's what's shown here on the, on the map on the right here, um, the proportion of mixed wood forest land that has a mixed wood understory, uh, where the yellows indicate not much of it has a mixed wood understory, and the blue indicates most of it is a mixed wood understory. And you can see that uh, we sort of have this niche match within our mixed woods here in the state of Missouri. Lots of yellow. Um, where the blue tends to happen is where we have the juniper, the, the cedar. Um, so again, we should take these forest type group results um, very carefully when we're thinking about uh, what the trends mean, because sometimes there's some gotchas in there. Uh, moving back to, to results for statewide, um, prominent species across the state. We've seen a slight decrease in the number of trees uh, across the state of Missouri. Um, and some of those are typified by the species we see here. These are the five most prominent species um, across the state. Um, and we see that species like white oak and dogwood and post oak and black oak have slight to, to moderate declines in their numbers uh, over the past 15 years or so. And again, cedar has increased. Um, since around 2008, cedar has been the most abundant species in Missouri. So I guess it's the king of Missouri, unfortunately, or, you know, fortunately, it's, it's not like I have an ax to grind against uh, cedar. I'd really rather use a chainsaw, but uh, it's just jumping out in the data. And so I think it's worth mentioning uh, here that, that cedar is increasingly important uh, species in the state. Um, so while the number of trees were declining a bit over the last uh, 15 years, the size of trees is uh, well, they're staying flat or slightly increasing. So the basal area per acre here, you see not a, a huge trend here. Cedar's increasing a bit, but most of these are staying flat. So the trees that we're losing, the other ones are growing and making up for. So essentially the, the, the forests are maturing, which makes sense with the age distribution. They're getting fewer trees, they're getting bigger. That's how stands develop. Uh, sorry, move backwards. If we look at it in terms of volume, for the most part, the species are um, stable, slightly increasing, and if we looked at it cumulatively across the entire state for all species, all live volume um, has been increasing now for some time, and while the increase is slight and slower than it once was, it's still increasing. Uh, if we look at only growing stock stems, those are the more merchantable ones, um, we're pretty stable there in terms of our volume. We're not building that as fast as we're building all live volume, and saw log volume is slightly increasing as well. So increases in volume. So on net, we're growing in Missouri. Uh, the forest is growing, but there's some winners and losers. If we look on the left, the most prominent losers are scarlet oak and blackjack oak. Uh, we lost nearly 10 million uh, cubic feet volume of scarlet oak uh, per year is, is how that shakes out. And blackjack oak is nearly that. 
Uh, but the net winners in terms of annual change in volume, well, cedar, uh, but also white oak. White oak is, is growing uh, as well. Increases for black oak and on down the line, those are the 10 most um, positive changes as well as the five most negative changes for volume by species. Um, in total across the state, growth is around 700 um, million cubic feet of, um, of volume. Mortality is, is around 300 million cubic feet and removals is somewhere around 165. So depending on how you want to calculate, if you want to go off gross uh, growth, we grow about four times more than we remove. If you want to go off net, which is growth minus mortality, we grow about twice as much uh, volume as we remove each year. Um, and if you do all the math and do all the subtractions, our net change is around 200 million cubic feet added of volume each year in Missouri forests. Now, around 32 million trees die each year. Um, that sounds like a lot. Uh, these are trees over five inches in diameter, but over the scale of, well, it's not quite 8 billion trees. That's all live trees. We have a little over 2 billion trees greater than 5 inches. So that equates to around 1.5% mortality each year, uh, which is really normal. Uh, that's nothing to be alarmed at. Um, the trees that we lost the most of each year, black oak, we lost over 4 million, white oak, 3. Um, but if you look at those percentages there, for the most part, these are in the 1 to 2% range. Um, black jack oak is one of the higher ones there at 5% of its population. The most common cause of death is, on the graph on the right here, unknown. Now, I'm not Stone Phillips, and this isn't an you know, unsolved mystery, so I won't pursue that any further. It's just a cause of death that isn't related to one of the other categories here. Uh, when we know what the cause of death, or when we have a reasonable guess of what the cause of death was, um, it's most commonly disease, uh, right there around 11 million trees per acre each year. Uh, that died. Weather and vegetation are the prominent ones. Insects, fires, and animals uh, aren't really the most uh, prevalent forms of uh, tree mortality in the state. Uh, trees die, uh, but also trees are born, and we have seedlings. Um, some states are pretty depauper for seedlings. Uh, we are fortunate enough that we have um, usually some seedlings in the understory, but there's been some pretty interesting trends going on over the past 15 years or so across the state. Um, the most prominent seedling species in the state is white ash. And that is, was a bit surprising to me. Um, and it's not like some fluke thing that's only happening in some part of the state. Uh, increases in white ash have been uh, across the state uh, in, in all four major ecological sections that I've looked at. Um, and what that means, I'm not quite sure. Um, if that means that we have a chance to uh, maybe lifeboat ash as the ash borer takes care of the overstory and wipes that out or most of it over the next several years. You know, do we have a chance, this white ash in the understory to, to prolong that a little longer? And if so, how long is that window of opportunity there? Uh, where did all these ash come from? These are questions that, gosh, sound like excellent research projects. And things I just don't know the answer to yet, but I think would be worth looking at. Um, aside from white ash, interesting dynamics, hackberry is increasing. Uh, in terms of seedling populations. Uh, whether you look at it in terms of per acre on the left or composition on the right, you see the same trends, just slightly different scales. In third place, the third most common seedling is white oak, so that's a good news. Um, we seem to not have many troubles finding white oak seedlings um, on average across the state. Um, but regeneration is a tricky business, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty involved. Um, some research we've done looking at data across the northern and eastern U.S. Um, if we want to have uh, or, or judge the, the likelihood that we'll have a uh, successful generation of it, we can look at the number of seedlings and, and sprouts and other things in the understory and, and get a good guess at that. Um, and if our basic regeneration objective is just simply to have a young forest with species that were at least somewhat similar to those that were in the overstory ahead of time, um, if we look at that map on the left there, where the darker blue suggests that more of the plots might have enough seedlings available uh, for that regeneration objective to be plausible. Um, Missouri is better positioned than some other places, you know, around 57% or so of the plots that were examined in Missouri um, show that the seedling population alone makes regeneration plausible. 
Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. I hope you can tell from the tone of my voice that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in these estimates. Um, we're not going to say that regeneration is going to be successful, um, but in the best case scenario, it could be. Um, and we can certainly say relative to some other places in similar forest types, uh, Missouri is better positioned. Um, we also know that ceilings aren't the only uh, regeneration source available in the state. Um, you can see on the graph on the right, potential stump sprouts uh, for oaks. Um, we have a pretty vast reservoir of, of potential regeneration sources there on, on stump sprouts. The bad news with that is if you want a new tree, you have to cut the old tree down uh, for those sprouts to play out. So it's not exactly a net gain. In fact, it's usually a net loss because not all trees are gonna sprout, uh, but they are a good supplemental source um, of regeneration. An important thing, uh, across the, the East is, is white oak regeneration. We're really interested in this, uh, both in terms of the resource for, uh, you know, wood products and, and uh, barrels and, and lumber and so on and so forth, but also for, for wildlife and all the other uh, ecosystem services that white oak uh, plays a key role in. And we can see that Missouri is sort of the mecca of white oak uh, in the canopy. Uh, we have, you know, nearly 10 to 12 million acres in Missouri where a white oak is present. Uh, according to some of these estimates. And that's a higher concentration in Missouri than in other places. Um, <clears throat> if we look at canopy stocking, not just acres where oak is present, but how many oaks are present, um, we have over 30% stocking on, of canopy white oaks. That's dominant or co-dominance in many places in the state. So not only do we have white oaks, um, commonly we have uh, them in, in dominant, co-dominant positions. Um, so they're an important part of the forest here. But moving forward, you know, we want to be able to sustain that resource into the future. And if we look at, uh, on the left here, plots that had white oak seedlings on them, where a red color means there was a white oak seedling and a blue color means that there was not, so they were absent. You know, we have a fair smattering of, of red dots there, some blue in Missouri, um, but more red than many other places in the eastern U.S., uh, suggesting that we have some seedlings there, that, that regeneration could be plausible. But on the right, if we move up to the sapling class, you know, there's very few red dots there, meaning that we're mostly absent of saplings. We have more here than in other places, which I guess is some consolation. Um, but still, the story there is, is a little bit alarming. Uh, now these are immature forests. Uh, so this suggests that if we want canopy recruitment of white oaks in the future, it's going to have to uh, require some management. It's going to be something we want to do on purpose uh, because just by happenstance, um, it's it's not as, as easy to get as uh, we would like. So moving back to some regional highlights of um, forests across the state of Missouri. We've got four major ecological sections here. Um, we've got the central dissected till plains in blue in the north, the Osage plains in purple in the west, um, the Ozark highlands in red there, really the, the meat of Missouri, um, and the boot hill, the white and black river alluvial plains uh, there in green in the corner. Um, and we can see that in each of those regions, um, well, really, uh, in, in the Ozarks, uh, most of the forest land, or most of the land is forest land, around 52%. And it's really the only one where the majority of the land area is forest land. Um, and it makes up the big bulk of Missouri's forest land itself. Um, but other, you know, places have, um, forest present, you know, in the central till plains, we have 15% of the land area, uh, occupied by forest. Age structure across these various ecological sections here, uh, really the same story as we saw across the state. Um, if we look at it in terms of percent, um, young, pole, mature, and old, uh, similar age structures uh, in each, each region. Um, you'll notice that there's no young forest showing up in the uh, boot hill alluvial plains there. I, I think that's just a function of that being not a lot of forest there and, and the sample size we got going here. I wouldn't say that that's any more or less alarming than the fact that young forest is um, rare across the state in each ecological section. Forest composition across the regions. <clears throat> we see that um, oak and hickory is a major constituent of the forest. Um, really in, in almost all the places, the boot hill is the exception there, the alluvial plains. Um, where elm ash cottonwood is the most prominent forest type, followed by oak gum cypress, which, you know, things sort of make sense is what we expect to find 
uh, in those sorts of places. But the rest of the ecological sections, um, oak hickory is the most prevalent, followed by elm ash cottonwood um, and other forest types to various degrees. Now, interestingly, um, I mentioned earlier the white ash being the most common seedling. Again, we see it among the top five seedlings across each of the regions. Uh, but the top five seedling species aren't exactly the same in all the regions. Hackberry and white ash are present in uh, all of them in the top five, uh, but there are some differences there. Um, you know, in some of the forest types, uh, like or some of the ecological sections, excuse me, like the Ozark Highlands, um, dogwood, sassafras, and white oak are common as seedlings whereas those species don't really show up as seedlings in the other uh, ecological sections there. In fact, white oak only shows up in the Ozark Highlands in terms of being in the top five uh, most prominent seedling species. Um, in the Till Plains, we have more elms uh, and alphorn being present. In the Osage Plains, um, again, elms and, and hackberry. Okay, so looking at a uh, sort of net annual change for each of the ecological sections, um, we're net positive in each section. This is looking at softwood versus hardwood. Um, and we, you know, most of the forest is hardwood uh, species. So we have higher gains in the hardwood as opposed to the softwood, but across each region, um, we have net gains in growth versus removal and mortality uh, for both components um, in each region. And I think I would be remiss if I was talking about the state of the forest and didn't uh, mention another item of interest. That's uh, the impact and potential influence that invasives have, not only on the forest today, but the forest in the future. Um, if we look at the percentage of plots that were inventoried for invasive species on the left there, um, and the higher, the brighter colors indicating plots were, uh, uh, areas where a higher percentage of the plots were invaded uh, by these forest invaders. Um, you can see that Missouri has a lot of bright colors there. Um, in the Ozarks, there are some places that are, are fairly dark, uh, but relative to some other places, I mean, we're, we have a high proportion of invaded plots. And, and the most common invaders, according to the data at hand, is uh, species like multiflora rose, Japanese, a mere honeysuckle, which really should come as any surprise, Black locust shows up on this list. It's considered an invasive species. And, you know, I might say, well, why is black locust on this list and not red cedar? Uh, but that's not for me to, to decide. Uh, but an interesting point. Um, garlic mustard, reed canary grass, creeping jenny, autumn olive, and common buckthorn round out the list of most prevalent in terms of species um, covers uh, invaders that we find in the state. So some highlights. Um, total forest land acreage has stabilized, uh, as Director Paula mentioned, uh, over the past 15 or 20 years. Uh, we're not really losing or adding much in any given year uh, across the state in total, but it's dynamic locally. Uh, we got lots of fragmentation and conversions going on at the local scale. Uh, so it's sort of this, this uh, chess game or, uh, you know, we're moving cups around, um, but the, uh, the, the pie stay in the same size. Our forests are getting older. Um, that's something that we've talked about already. Uh, total tree numbers are decreasing a little bit, but stocking and standing volume are increasing. And across the state, growth outpaces removal. Uh, there's some interesting understory trends afoot. Uh, some of those I mentioned and some others we'd like to look at in future. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, at least I am increasingly becoming aware of, and this is old news to many folks, but, uh, you know, we have to really be mindful of how we're managing canopy, canopy recruitment, not just seedlings, but recruitment into the canopy of both desirables and undesirables, um, so that the forests we have in the future um, fill the roles that we want them to fill and, and serve the needs that we need them to serve. Um, Wide-scale composition shifts could be um, detrimental, and, and we want to safeguard against that. So keep an eye on that. Um, with that, I would like to thank everyone for their attention. Thank for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'll take some time for a discussion of questions, if there are any. 
Yeah, we do have a few questions for you, Lance. Um, one would be just, I think, uh, explaining some definitions and what you re what you mean in terms of growth and removal. Uh, the question was, uh, they said 64 acres of year revert to forest while 71 acres of year converted from forest. So how does that work? So uh, just, I think it's more of a definitional thing of what you're referring to as growth and what you're referring to as removal. I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question one time, please? Yeah, so the question was about the uh, growth and removals and then they were citing that there was um, so many acres that were converted each year and so many acres added each year to our forest base. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think some confusion as to what you meant by growth and removal. Yeah, sure. So growth and removal is in terms of actual uh, volume in um, wood uh, on an acre or across the state. And, and so in net, uh, we can have increases in the amount of wood in the state while losing forest land acres in places. Um, so it's sort of a definitional uh, difference there. It's not minutiae, it's really an important difference. Um, uh, we, we can lose forest land um, while other land is growing and, and making up for that. Um, those things uh, can, can equal out, balance each other out or not. And in the case of Missouri, um, despite all the um, fragmentation and transitioning of land types, uh, we still um, seem to grow more than we remove in terms of harvest and mortality. Um, there probably is some flub there that we don't catch when we just lose the forest land uh, at all and it goes underreported, uh, but we have to rely on the, the integrity of our samples for that. Okay, and how are you with uh, pre-settlement conditions? Of Missouri's forests, um, there was a well. There was a question about uh, what was the different. From, how are forest types different from pre-European settlement forest composition? In other words, how has extraction influenced forest type composition from pre-settlement to today? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm confident that there are people vastly more qualified to answer that than I am. But I think, in general, it's safe to say that. Um, Forests are much denser than they are, are denser now than they were uh, pre-settlement. Um, and the compositions are probably um, a bit different. We probably had um, more open um, uh, uh, forests with species that, um, you know, pines and, and, and oaks uh, in, in more of a woodland-esque um, setting, uh, right? Where we had fire and things moving through uh, that beat down some of the underbrush uh, compared to now. Um, now, pre-settlement can last a long time. It can mean a lot of things. Uh, so I'm waffling on that a bit, but by and large, I think we, we could assume that we have um, denser forests today with slightly different, or in some cases, drastically different compositions that were there, say, 200 years ago. Yeah, I'd agree with that assessment. We probably had a lot more shortleaf pine at that time pre-settlement today we probably have a higher abundance of the black oak scarlet oak kind of mix in a lot of our forest types than what would have been there pre-settlement so the next question your chart shows considerable growth in white oak and black walnut since 2004 yet we hear that the processors of these species are worried about the decline of availability what would be your insight there I think those um, related graphs, I don't have any for uh, black walnut specifically um, other than the one you cited, but the, uh, the related graphs for white oak in terms of the saplings um, and looking at that resource moving forward. Um, you know, it, for every white oak we cut, we're gonna have to have more than one growing in the understore because some of them are gonna die as they mature. Um, so I think it, it is um, very prudent and, and um, wise to be concerned about uh, their future uh, as a resource because, again, it, it seems to be that we're struggling to recruit them into the overstory. Um, less so here in Missouri, but we still have our own struggles. Um, so I think that would be a, uh, a reason for the decline uh, and, and why we should be concerned. Sure, the ones we have are growing, uh, but they're not going to live forever, and we're going to eventually, uh, at least some of them, want to use them for um, you know, various products. So we gotta be thinking about the next generation.
Okay. Somebody just commented that was interesting. Ceresia lespides and invasive pear tree varieties are not mentioned. So I don't know uh, if you saw that, any of those in your analysis. They, they show up. And I was really surprised, uh, actually, by those two. Um, because I seem to find them more, and it just may be a shortcoming of the invasive data. It's not sampled intensively uh, as the tree data, nor as intensively in Missouri or in the north as in some of the southern states. But certainly Ceresia lespedeza and the pears, I mean, driving around, uh, I live in Jefferson City, so driving around mid-Missouri, but Jefferson City specifically, um, in spring, you know, it's like, oh, wow, look at all these dogwoods. Wait a minute, that's pear. Oh, my goodness. Um, it, it's sort of eye-opening. Um, I, I can't speak to why that's not showing up, but I agree. That is, that is um, a bit puzzling. Then again, a, a definition when you're referring to mixed woods combinations, are they combinations of conifers and hardwoods generally, or how would you define mixed woods? Oh, my goodness. I didn't state the definition of that. My apologies. Uh, yes, when we're speaking of mixed woods, it's um, – hardwoods and softwoods, deciduous and conifers um, growing together um, where one or the other broadleaf or uh, conifer doesn't make up more than 75% or 80% of the composition. So we have a, a, not necessarily an even mix, but a, a substantial component of each uh, type in the forest. Okay. This was a question I had also that somebody had submitted. Uh, when you're talking about mortality, can we attribute the mortality of white oak and black oak to harvest? Harvest was not listed as a cause of mortality when you're looking at the uh, type. So it seems that many harvests now cut black oak hard due to red oak mortality, or is aging out still the main cause of death? Well, the, the mortality figures um, that I was showing um, mm, many of them were after accounting for um, removals, um, not in all cases, because removal is um, one of the causes of death that could have been treated there. Um, so, yes, it's possible that some of the mortality was due to cutting, uh, but by and large, um, it's, it's other mortality events. Okay. Do you know why pin oaks are increasing while other red oak species are decreasing? Oh. <laughs> I'll just keep it short and sweet on that one. Actually, I don't. Uh, that is a, an interesting um, uh, uh, trend there. Okay, something we can explore a little bit more and maybe uh, post on the website at some point. Do you think the changes in seedling species such as more white ash and hackberry are in any way related to climate change? What about the spread of red cedar? Is that climate or fire suppression? Might be a good question for uh, Leslie Brandt when she does the climate change presentation later on, but do you have any insights on that also? I think it could be plausible. I'm, I'm not going to say that it, that is the uh, driving factor, but I think it's certainly plausible that it plays a role. Um, you know, that's the thing about regeneration dynamics. They're so complex and have so many interesting and, and fascinating dynamics and drivers. Um, and, you know, disturbance histories, any number of things can contribute to regeneration outcomes and seeding populations. Um, but that being said, um, some things tend to go together and, and um, work synergi synergistically. And, uh, hotter, drier with more fire or wetter with less fire, you know, those tend to work together and less disturbance uh, of other types mixed along there um, as, as well. Those, those tend to work in, in concert and tandem and, and one depend on the other. So, uh, yes, I certainly think that it is it's plausible that that's, um, you know, maybe not a long-term climate signal because seedlings are, are pretty short-lived for the most part, uh, but, but certainly um, a byproduct of of, of trends in weather and, and, and disturbance histories.
All right, in Southeast Missouri, does disruption of natural hydrology perhaps contribute to forest loss? Not sure if that's your expertise, but do you have any views on it? That is not my expertise. Um, disruptions of hydrology contributing to forest loss. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna punt on that one. I'm not quite sure. I mean, it would seem that uh, the primary source of forest loss is usually some form of land conversion, intentional land conversion, whether it be pasture, ag, subdivisions, you know, construction, development, kinds of things. I don't think FIA really dwells into that too much, though, does it? Um, well, it, at least not the work that, I, that I've done, and, and the, the data there is a bit more... Uh, uh, broad um, to try to tease up some of these things. I mean, I, I, it's certainly feasible. Um, if you have changing hydrology regimes, you know, some places may be becoming wetter, some places becoming drier. Um, and, you know, whether or not they were too wet or too dry to start with um, for forests can play a role. I really should just stop talking about this because I, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> All right. Another one that we might be able to uh, explore a little bit more for later. Do you have any stats on the effects of forest clearing for cattle production in the Ozarks? Again, another one about clearing, and, and can we, through FIA specifically, determine why it was cleared? Um, there are some, I think, land use change categories um, that could be explored. Um, and, and I think grazing, or maybe cattle production or, or pasture land is, is one of those that we could look at. I think that is a category in there. Okay, um, so something we could look into. Yeah. Do you have a measure on whether Missouri forests are more or less fragmented than before? In other words, are we seeing acreage stay the same, but in more fragmented chunks? Um, yeah, I think there is evidence of that. And I also think that some of the speakers later today will have some cool graphs and, and maps that sort of show that. I think I saw some of those in the warm-up slides yesterday. All right. Um, not sure if you can answer this, but who gets to designate black locust as invasive? <laughs> <laughs> but, but Linda Hetzel also has, a, has another comment here. Uh, she further elaborates on black locust um, as a multi-purpose tree species for temperate um, temperate use, I guess, and um, it's a nitrogen-fixing legume native to southern, southeastern North America, and now naturalized extensively in the temperate region of North America, Europe, and Asia. This tree is useful but underutilized for lumber poles and wood fiber, land reclamation, beekeeping, fuel, and forage. And I know I had received a uh, contact from an individual recently who was looking for black locust leaf samples to send to him because he was doing genetic analysis for black locust for some of these things. So it is being looked at as a future, more highly desired forest product. Yeah, I don't know who makes the call on, on leaving it invasive. You know, at the end of the day, everything's categorized as something or the other. Um, but no value judgment from me uh, there. Um, I think it's interesting, and, and I've debated with some of my uh, uh, one of my colleagues is an invasive expert, and, and we've sort of giggled and, and, and pondered why it, uh, black locust is on the invasive list. All right, I believe we already have kind of talked through this, and is that's a little bit of an unknown thing about uh, how does development contribute to losses, and we're just not quite sure where the loss is going at this point and what sources of losses are happening. What's causing yeah, that's, loss. that's information that um, I could probably track down, and um, I, I just don't have it at hand. Okay. That, that's a good point. Yep. Some things that, uh, as we're moving forward with the Forestry Summit and in our later sessions, that we can explore in greater detail. So is there any hope for mixed forests of hardwood and pines of the past, or is the focus of conservation more on general habitat versus historical habitat? Um, I, I, I think I'd like to answer yes to all the above there. Um, I, I would like to think that we can manage for oak and pine mixtures 
and also manage for diversity of habitats and, and quality of habitat um, and, and do so in a way that we can uh, meet, more lead, meet more needs than, than less and, 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 and try as best we can to have our cake and eat it too. And that sounds kind of Pollyannish and, and I know, but you know, at least we should strive for that. And I think we can uh, strive for that. Well, I would agree. We had this as part of our larger forestry summit agenda to have some specific discussion on uh, oak pine woodland management and places of restoration are occurring. So uh, I'm sure we'll revitalize it as we move forward with another session and discuss this in greater detail because there are some good examples in Missouri where this kind of work is going on, but it will be more of a localized landscapes rather than across the entire Ozarks kind of a focus. Mm -hmm. That is our final question for you, Lance. You are the winner so far with questions. Ah. <laughs> uh, just a tribute to having an interesting <clears throat> Missouri but forest. I'll, I'll take one more that just popped up though, and this will have to be our final question and we'll need to move on to the next presenter as we're getting close on time. So many foresters say sugar maple seedlings are a concern to regeneration. Your data didn't show sugar maple much at all. The top three species were ash, hackberry, and white oak. Do you have any thoughts on that where sugar maple might be a major issue in the state, but not necessarily statewide, which is kind of what the data you presented was? Yeah, one of the interesting things, <coughs> excuse me, um, that, that <coughs> jumps out to me with sugar maple is especially in like the River Hills region, um, where we tend to expect that the, the soils and the climate's a, a little better suited to sugar maple than in some of the other places. Um, you know, a, a few uh, years ago, decade ago or so, um, there's some papers come out that said that there's a lot of sugar maple seedlings um, and, and they're a threat. And then, you know, that just, the sugar maples matured into the pole size class, or I should say saplings, right? Um, and, and so I think we had a, a big regeneration pulse of sugar maple and it transitioned into saplings in many places. Um, and it's just kind of hanging out. Um, and so it's, it's not there as a seedling anymore. It's, it's in a lot of places, there's the sapling. Um, and theoretically, they could reach into the canopy, but, you know, there's not just a ton of examples of uh, mature sugar maple dominated forests in the state. You know, there are pockets where you have an acre or so. Um, so I, th I think the question is, what's its longevity? How long does it last uh, sort of as a sapling? Um, because seedling populations can come and go um, and it's really, you know, whether you release them on purpose or it recruits to the canopy by itself. Um, the, the question in my mind for sugar maple um, is its longevity as a sapling. Well, thank you, Lance. I appreciate your time today. That ends our questions. And it certainly uh, was a great presentation, stimulated a lot of discussion. And as with a lot of research that's done, as you mentioned, it always brings up ideas for additional research that needs to be done. And so hopefully we can look into some of those things for a future forestry summit and uh, tackle those, those questions at that time. So at this point, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen and we will uh, move on to the next presenter, but appreciate your time today. Absolutely, thanks everyone.